The Difficult Path by Grace Lynn. When I was sold to the Lee family, my mother let Mrs. Lee take me only after she promised I would be taught to read. Her mother had 14 other children starving and clinging to her, yet she was still insisting that I promise. Mrs. Lee sniffed and began a high-pitched imitation. Promise me that when she's six, you'll have taught her to read on your ancestor's grave. Promise. You didn't have to agree, Auntie Wang replied peevishly. This was a story she had already heard many times. A girl? Learn to read? What a waste, Mrs. Lee continued, her annoyance at the past greater than Auntie Wang's with the present. Just because the mother had been a scholar's daughter. Then you shouldn't have lied, Auntie Wang said. Rolling her eyes, she helped herself to some honeyed lychees I held. I thought she would never know, Mrs. Lee said. I just said yes, so that I could take the baby and go. I made a soft coughing noise and placed the tray on the table. Mrs. Lee, I said, as I bowed low, teacher is here. She snorted with irritation and waved her arm, her voluminous silk sleeves flapping like a flag of surrender. Go, she dismissed me. I hid my smile and tried to walk as the brow-beaten servants were supposed to do. Unlike Auntie Wang, however, I was not tired of Mrs. Lee's complaining story. I had no memory of my mother, but hearing how she had dared to make demands of the formidable Mrs. Lee on my behalf always made me feel a sense of pride. Despite my mother's poor circumstances, she must have been spirited. And perhaps it was my mother's spirit that forced Mrs. Lee to keep her promise. For on the day I turned six, a new tutor came to the house of Lee. As I cringed during my daily duty of emptying the chamber pots, I saw the top of his black scholar's hat glide slowly past the family shrine into the schoolroom. He had come for Mrs. Lee's repulsive only son, Fu Ding, of course. The learned scholar was yet another tutor hired in hopes that Fu Ding could be taught something. The last two teachers had departed in disgrace as well as anger. For, because Fu Ding remained unable to read a single poem, Mrs. Lee had also refused the tutor's pay. My birthday and a new tutor's entry should have been a small consequence to the house of Lee, except it was also on that day that the incense of the ancestral shrine refused to light. Master Lee tried again and again, but no matter how large a flame he held, the incense would not burn. In desperation, Master Lee turned to the new tutor for answers. It is apparent, the scholar said, that you or someone in your household has shamed your ancestors. Perhaps someone has stolen something or broken a promise. Of course, Master Lee nodded with respect. Then he snapped at Mrs. Lee. Wipe! We have angered our ancestors. What have you done? The house of Lee roared into a typhoon as all, from the head cook to the lowliest servant, me, were questioned. When it was discovered that it was my sixth birthday... Mrs. Lee remembered her promise to my mother, then paled and swayed like a blanched stalk of bamboo. It couldn't be, she said in horror, but it could be and probably was, the new tutor said, and immediately quoted his price for two students. Mrs. Lee, still aghast at the revelation and fending off insults from her husband, did not even haggle over the price. She did try later, claiming that as a girl, I should be cheaper. But he responded that because I was a girl, he should be paid more. As he was making an exception, so the matter was dropped. And I began my education. That was over six years ago. It was also over six years ago that I saw my teacher walk in with a new pair of shoes. Those shoes glided on the smooth stone floor, only hesitating as he paused in front of the shrine. With a sharp glance around, he quickly changed the incense, ensuring my lessons in his larger salary. 
You are late, Lingsy, teacher said, but without anger. He knew Mrs. Lee was always the reason for my tardiness. You are late, Lingsy, teacher said, but without anger. He knew Mrs. Lee was always the reason for my tardiness. Lingsy is late, Fu Ding sneered. I tried to consider Fu Ding with kindness, for it was his inability to read little more than his name that had granted me so many years of lessons. But it was difficult. His body had, over the years, grown into a man's, but he was still the same lazy, spoiled brat he had been as a boy. If anything, the years had made him even more horrible. For now, he had a more vicious streak that delighted in cruelty. I couldn't help shivering when I saw that he was pulling the legs off crickets again. Today's poem, teacher said, ignoring Fu Ding, is The Difficult Path by Li Po. I knelt at the table and began to read. I will ride the winds and surmount endless waves, setting sail on the vast ocean. I will one day reach the distant shores. The ocean, I murmured. I had been outside the walled estate of House of Lee only a handful of times. However, one time, Shu Wan, the head cook, and I had been sent to town to buy pepper. And I had caught a glimpse of the sea, but only a glimpse. For when I tried to see more, I was yanked away. Shu Wan had a terror of pirates and was convinced that just by looking at the sea, it could make them appear. Li Po writes of endless hardships, teacher said, but you also feel his valiant spirit. I hope this is something that you remember, Ling Si. I looked up at him. The question in my eyes since I dared not to ask with my voice. Today is our last lesson, teacher said. Mrs. Lee has informed me that Fu Ding will soon be marrying age and his time must be now spent in other ways. We both glanced at Fu Ding, who was creating a pile of dead insects, and then quickly looked away. My eyes filled with tears. I had known that these lessons would not continue forever but now they were ending, I felt I could not bear it. You have learned so much, Ling Si, teacher said to me kindly. You are a very smart and clever pupil. If you had been a boy, I have no doubt that you would have won honors at the imperial examination. I tried to smile, but could only bow my head. I felt teacher's hand gently rest upon it. Mencius, the second sage, said that there are three joys in this world. He said, health, a clear conscience, and teaching those who are worthy. Teaching you has been a joy, Ling Si. My tears continued to drop long after our last lesson, long after teacher had left the house of Lee and I swept up Fu Ding's collection of insects. They even continued as I scrubbed the pots in the kitchen much to the annoyance of the other servants. Stop your crying, Bissy snapped, carrying over dirty bowls for me to wash. We've got enough to do without listening to your sniffling. Look at me, Shuan said. I have to prepare lunch boxes for the entire household. And am I wailing? And Hebo and Mugang and all the men have to prepare the sedan chairs and get ready to carry fat fooding for honor hours tomorrow. And they aren't crying either, so your sniveling is not welcome. I gulped and rubbed my face with my sleeve. Why are we getting lunch boxes and sedan chairs ready? I asked. Where is the family going? Where are we all going, you mean? Bissy said. They're taking us all this time, even you. Me? I asked, surprised. I had assumed that Mrs. Lee and the family were going to an extravagant picnic or visiting Aunt Zhu or some other rich cousin's mansion. Where? Why? It's the first of the month, stupid, Bissy said. You may have gotten all those fancy lessons and learned to read, but you're still not very smart. They are taking us to the temple service, of course, but the temple of longevity is not ours. I began... We're not going to the Temple of Longevity, Bissy said with exasperation. 
but I could see that her frustration was more about the inconvenience than it was for me. We're off to the Infinite Stream Temple this time. That huge gold temple by the ocean, I said? Why? For Fu Ding, of course, Shu Wan said. Mrs. Lee hopes that she can get the abbot to be a matchmaker for, her, for him. Infinite Stream Temple? That's why it has so much money, it gets infinite stream of brides. She'll need an elephant's weight of gold to get a matchmaker for Fu Ding, Bissy grunted. No matchmaker is going to arrange a marriage with a well-born girl to that rice bucket. You'd think Mrs. Lee would know that. She does. Mrs. Lee is no fool. Why do you think Shu Wan stopped and both servants looked at me oddly? What? I asked. As the silence grew longer, I put down the teapot I was washing and glared at them. What? I demanded. Tell me. By the time Fu Ding was seven, everyone knew he was a brute as well as an idiot, Shu Wan said. And Mrs. Lee knew that he might have a hard time finding a bride. Why do you think Mrs. Lee was so desperate for you, the granddaughter of a scholar, Bissy said. She could have gotten any peasant's kid for cheaper and without silly promises. She wanted a girl of good blood just in case. I stared. If Mrs. Lee couldn't find a suitable bride, I was going to marry Fu Ding? Me? I felt as if I had eaten spoiled fish. You're not marrying age yet. Shu Wan said, trying to be kind. You have a couple of years. That's why Mrs. Lee is trying to find Fu Ding a bride now. She's hoping she can get someone else to marry Fu Ding before you'd have to. Though, I'd say that's a pretty bleak hope, Bissy sniffed. I'd say that's a pretty bleak hope, Bissy sniffed. I thought of Fu Ding and his hairy fingers that were too clumsy to hold a paintbrush, but so adept at torturing bugs. If I had listened more carefully, would I have heard their silent screams? Tears of horror filled my eyes. Shu Wan heaved an impatient sigh. You made her cry again, she complained. Well, Bissy retorted, at least this time she's got a good reason. The next morning, the streets around the House of Lee overflowed with servants, horses, and sedan chairs. Mrs. Lee's chair was so large that it needed four men on either side to carry it. Fu Ding's was not as large, but he was so heavy that the same number of men were needed to carry him. Then the cousins and aunts filled the carriages and the horses were burdened with the supplies and gifts. Shu Wan, Bissy, and I were to share a donkey with the agreement that we would take turns riding, even though I had doubts about when my turn would be. It's sheer craziness, Shu Wan grumbled as we paraded past the gawking neighbors, most of them awed by the grandness of our procession. Going to that ocean temple carrying chests of jade and strings of cash will be prime targets for robbers. I wouldn't be surprised if pirates docked their boats just to raid us. I remembered Shu Wan's fear of pirates. Weren't some pirates seen recently, I asked slyly. I think someone said it was the rat red flag fleet. I hope not, Shu Wan said with such fear that I felt a little bad for teasing her. They are the worst. No one can stop the red flag fleet. The Imperial Navy has tried three times to capture them, Bissy said helpfully, but failed each time. I heard that the Emperor has even offered amnesty to the captain and the crew if they'd agree to retire. Why would they retire? Shu Wan said. They take what they want and no one can stop them. And here we're going with all our gold. We might as well be throwing it into the ocean for them. The trip to Infinite Stream Temple was a long one, but enjoyable. My turn to ride the donkey came much sooner than I had it expected. For my short legs could not keep up with the procession, and Shuan was ordered to allow me to ride so that I wouldn't slow down the group. She did this begrudgingly, until it was discovered that because I was so small, the donkey could bear the weight of another. So I rode along merrily, enjoying Shuan and Bissy's bickering about who would ride with me. 
and I mar marveled at all that I saw. Even the scrubby, unkempt brush of the dirt road was a pleasure to see. Mrs. Lee insisted that her residence be immaculate at all times. Even stray leaves had to be plucked from the paths of the garden. I knew this because clearing the walkways was one of my favorite jobs. But the scene was what mesmerized me. It whispered with a quiet thunder. And when I saw the waves made of dragon scales, just like in one of Lee Poe's poems, I ga gasped. However, after 36 twists and turns of the valley, the infinite stream temple came into view. High on a rocky hill, it was impossible to miss, for even from a distance the temple was a brilliance of gold. The temple's bright yellow and red walls and roofs dazzled, a loud, vibrating blare among the soft grays and silvers of the landscape. If I were a pirate, I said, I'd raid that temple myself. Shut up about pirates already, Shu Wan snapped. I grinned, and our procession began along the path toward the temple. As the donkey climbed, I heard the murmur of the sea, as if it were sighing a secret, and turned to look down at it. From my seat on the donkey, I could see the expanse of the ocean, the rolling waves glistening like silver folds of silk embroidered with threads of... Red? I straightened. Unmoving and still, a dozen large junks sat in the water, the mass red raft spikes stabbing into the sky, as if waiting. Waiting for what? Their captain and crew? But only the seamen who would dare raise a crimson sail were the red flag fleet pirates. I scanned the shoreline below and stared at the sampans, 50 of them, or maybe even a hundred, all piled together like discarded shoes in the sand. As one stray sampan began to bob away, I felt my own thoughts lurch. There were pirates here. Bissy, I said, grabbing her arm. Pirates! Stop teasing, she won. Bissy shook me off. You little brat, you think you're so funny. But her voice trailed off as hundreds of screams echoed from the front of the procession. Servants, silk, and sedans seemed to fly toward me, and I felt Bissy throw herself from the donkey, shoving me face first onto the ground. Something, something hard hit the back of my head, but before all became black, I knew that the Lee family had reached the doors of the temple and had been welcomed in by the pirates. I dreamed I was a small child being rocked gently in a mother's arms. Shh, she whispered in my ear. Shh. Is that one awake yet? A rough voice said. My eyes flew open. The soft rocking had been caused by the waves of the sea and the ocean's roar had been the whisper. I sat up and saw a splash of red against blue, an unfurled sail against the sky. I was on a pirate boat. Now she is, another voice hooted. A forest of men stood before me, but beneath the raucous laughter, I heard sniffling. I looked and saw Bissy next to me, whimpering like a puppy. This was supposed to be a grab and go, a man said. The captain's not going to like seeing these prisoners. Indeed, a low voice behind me said, as all the men immediately quieted. She does not. The captain was a woman? She strode forward. And it was then I saw Tian Yi, the captain of the Red Flag Fleet, the most feared pirate of the sea. I could only gape. Teacher had once told me about the powerful goddess Zi Wang Mu and how she was sometimes described as ferocious and terrible, having the claws and teeth of a tiger and the tail of a panther. She was also described as being incredibly lovely and the queen of the heavens.
I had protested at the conflicting descriptions. I had thought it was impossible for one to be so beautiful and so fierce at the same time. But as I gazed at Tian Yi, I suddenly understood. Her black silk hair billowed like the sails behind her, and her eyes sparkled like black coals ready to flame. Well, Weigu, Tian Yi said, and I saw the pirate actually whiten. I thought maybe that one could be ransomed, the pirate named Wegu replied, nodding toward me. That family had a child, right? I thought maybe this one was it. Tian Yi gave me a quick glance and made a sound of annoyance. Stupid donkey, look at her. Are those the clothes of someone from a rich family? She said she grabbed my hands and thrust them in the pirate's face. Look at these hands. These are the hands of a servant. There's no ransom here, idiot. The pirate cowered as Tian Yi looked around. And what straw brag grabbed her? She said, nodding towards Bissy. Dihan took her, one of the men said. He thought she was pretty. Did he? Tian Tian Yi said dangerously. She drew her sword and walked to a man, placing her sword at his neck. If you tried to spoil her, I'll cut your head off. I didn't, the man protested. I promise. I know, Tian Yi said with a sweet smile, putting her sword away. That's why I'm not going to. I thought, you know, how the Po Sea pirates asked us for a woman to trade, and we owe them for that fight with the Imperial Navy when our other ships were late, and, and, Dahan began to stammer. Tian Yi looked at Bissy. Even with her nose red from crying, she did look rather nice and contemplated. For a brief moment, I saw Tian Yi's eyes flash with pity. Too plain, Tian Yi said, looking away. She tossed her hand. They won't want her. Too plain? Dihan asked. That's what you said last time. Do you think I cannot judge a woman's beauty? Tian Yi said taking a step towards him like Wegu, Dihan cringed. Give them enough cash to return and we'll drop them off at the next port. Then, throwing Dihan a, clo- a cold glance, she added, perhaps we should have your wife help you bring them to shore. Please, I was shocked to hear my own voice. Don't send me back. Everyone looked at me in astonishment and I could not blame them. But even though the words had spelled out of me without thought, I suddenly found that I truly meant them. What did I have to return to? Being bossed by everyone, scrubbing chamber pots, and marrying Fu Ding? I shuddered at the thought. But Tian Yi had already dismissed me. This is a pirate ship, not a nursery, she said. Then, addressing the crew, she ordered, Bring up the rest of the loot! I bowed my head, surprised by the tears that filled my eyes. Bissy hissed a stream of insults at me, which, after years of practice, I easily ignored. Instead, after wiping my eyes, I found myself fascinated as the men threw the chests and the packages from the sandpans in such a well-practiced rhythm that it seemed to match the movement of the waves but not perfect. Hey, dumb melon, shouted a pirate as another fumbled with a crate of tea bricks. It splashed into the water. Oh, I groaned. And that was Iron Goddess tea. I had spoken aloud, thinking no one was listening to me, but T and Yi had the ears of a tiger and turned at my words. How do you know that was Iron Goddess tea? She demanded. It said so, I answered, on the label. And this batch here, she said, pointing to another tea brick. Is this Iron Goddess too? No, I said. It says Mountain Silver Needle Tea. Tian Yi tore open the package, broke off some leaves in her hands and smelled the tea. She looked at me carefully, her eyes piercing. Come with me, she ordered. She led me into the captain's quarters, where I gazed around with great interest. It was a room of luxury, 
lavish silks draped over plush cushions, an intricately carved sandalwood bed, and red lanterns. In the entrance, two small wooden soldiers stood guard in front of a shrine that housed a goddess carved of ivory surrounded by marigolds. Tian Yi motioned me to sit, and I watched cautiously as she pulled out a wooden chest, plain and uncarved. Long ago, we raided a passenger ship. While all the wealthy nobles threw their goods at us and begged for mercy, one man jumped in front of his chest and grabbed a sword, Tian Yi said. He held the sword as if it were a broomstick, and it was easy to see he was no match for even the smallest of my men. But he fought valiantly to protect his treasure. Her face softened at the memory. I would have spared him for that, but he was mortally wounded. Tian Yi worked the chest clasp as she continued. As he fought, I wondered what treasure he had that was so valuable. And when he died, I found it was this. She opened the chest and I gasped. Books! Hundreds of books! I put my hands on them reverently. Poems of Li Po, the classic of music, spring and autumn annals. Can you read these? Tian Yi asked me. I nodded. She looked at me, her eyes sparkling with an inner fire. Teach me, she said, and you can stay. So I did. Now, as I write this on a pirate ship, whose red sails paint the sky, I ride the vast ocean. The wind is wild and the waves are endless, and the shore is so distant it is hard to imagine that it even exists. But my head is raised, and I can't help but smile. For the path before me might be difficult, it will be my own.